Well, good morning. It's great to see everyone, and for those who are watching online or with us in Gallup, uh, thank you for joining us today. So, uh, w- real quickly, I want to let you know that after the service today, and then during the next two services, um, Eddie Smith is is here, and some of you know Eddie from a long time ago, because he was in high school when I got here, which was a long time ago. Um, but anyway, Eddie and his wife, Jen, are preparing uh, to be uh, on the translation team with uh, Wycliffe Bible Translators. And so he's going to be out by the fireplace, and then he will be uh, actually in the large classroom uh, and answering questions and different things like that uh, over uh, the next two services. So if you want to catch up with him, ask what's going on, uh, I think uh, he will most likely land in one of the stands um, as far as Bible translation and different things like that. Uh, so it'd be great uh, to hear about the work that he and, and Jen uh, are going to be doing. So in 2017, my wife and I took a, uh, an anniversary trip, and we went to London. And on the last day of, of the trip, we actually uh, took the train ride out to, to Windsor, and Windsor is where Windsor Castle is, and we did the, the grand tour uh, of, of that place. Now, I, I can't really even begin to describe how enormous this particular castle actually is. If you've not been there, there's no way for me to let you see this with, with, with my imagination and, and my memory. The, the sheer size is something that I was not prepared for. In fact, we only toured, we toured for a couple of hours and only really toured a fraction of the castle. And, and what was amazing to me is sometimes we would go into rooms and, and it seemed like the ceilings were stories high. In fact, there was, there was one room that we went into, I think it was like the grand ballroom or something like that, and, and it felt like a football field. It was just that incredibly enormous. But there was one room that stood out uh, among all of them, and it was actually called the Grand Vestibule. And the Grand Vestibule was the very first room that we would have went into. In fact, a a few hundred years ago, and, and, and as dignitaries would show up and ambassadors would show up, this would be the first room that they would enter into. Now, we might think that they would have knickknacks and family pictures and family portraits out there, but that's not what kind of uh, adorned the walls, let's just put it that way. There were no pictures. There was no artwork. Here's basically what you saw when you looked up into this enormous room. Guns. Swords. All displayed in this artistic sort of way. Now, in my mind, I'm thinking that that was very strategic. That as as a king, and you have all of these powerful and mighty people coming and visiting your place, you don't talk about the family. You don't let everybody see your, your China collection, right? You put all of your power and your military might and your importance on full display so that people that are walking in, they might just get the impression, don't mess with them. You see, I think the kings and kingdoms of this world love to put their power and their importance and their military might on full display. In fact, I think about since the advent of photography, since the advent of uh, uh, video cameras, uh, the tyrants of the world love to show the rest of the world how important they are and how strong they are and how much military might they have. You see, kings do all that they can to promote their kingdoms. It's just what they do. So this year, 
we have predominantly been diving into the book of Mark. And as the book of Mark begins, Mark begins it in such a way as to say, one greater than Caesar is coming. You see, the entire known world was ruled by this one emperor. His name was, was Caesar, and there was no one greater than him, and everyone knew it. But as Mark begins to tell the biography of Jesus, he basically lays out this incredible claim that one greater than Caesar is, is on his way. And in fact, the, the way Mark begins is, is as if the, the visiting dignitary is coming. And by and large, while Mark lays out a pretty incredible claim that Jesus is greater than Caesar... For the first 10 chapters, it seems like Jesus does what he can to kind of squelch that image. You know, oftentimes he'll tell people, don't tell anybody what I just did for you. He tried to keep that message kind of under wraps. But as we begin in the 11th chapter, it is as if Jesus is now ready to put his kingdom on full display. But this is a different kind of kingdom. And the reason why it's a different kind of kingdom is that this is a different kind of king. So we're going to start in Mark chapter 11 here today. That's page 847 in the Bibles that are in the seats in front of you. And I'm just going to throw this out. If you do not have a Bible of your own, you are more than welcome to take one of ours and put it uh, in, in your name, write your name in it, and, and use that as you begin to know the story of Jesus. But let's go ahead and begin with verse 1. Now, when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethpage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village in, in front of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find a colt, on which uh, no one has ever sat, untie it and, and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, the, the Lord has need of it, and, and we'll send it back here immediately. And, and when they went and found the colt tied uh, at, at a door outside in the street, and they untied it, and some uh, of those standing there said to them, what are you doing untying the colt? And they told them that Jesus had said, uh, what, what Jesus had said, and they let them go. So it's interesting. Uh, I, I really want to kind of lock into one sort of thing here. Uh, I want to go back to verse 3, if we can kind of put that up here on the screen. Now, this is odd. Uh, we're, we're working through the book of Mark, and I'm just going to say this is odd, and the reason why this is odd is that this is typically what we talk about at Easter. I don't think I have ever preached Easter sermons and the Easter story typically outside of Easter. So we get to have Easter in July and August this year as we kind of tell the story uh, of Jesus last week. But notice verse 3, because verse 3, it says, If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord has need of it, and we'll send it back here uh, immediately. Now, honestly, this is, this is one of the few times in, in, in Jesus' ministry in the book of Mark that he refers to himself as Lord. There was actually a time in, in chapter 2 where he, he says that, that the Son of Man, that was Jesus' favorite title for himself, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Uh, while he was in Gentile territory, he refers to himself as Lord when he told the Gerasene demoniac, Go home and, and tell your family what the Lord has done for you. But Jesus is not flippant with this particular statement about himself that he is Lord. Now, I, I think it's important that we unpack the word Lord here today because outside the church, in our culture, we don't use this word. I mean, think about it. Outside of religious context, outside of Christianity context, when was the last time you used the term Lord in a sentence? 
You just typically don't do that here. And so one of the things that that does, it kind of places us at a competitive disadvantage with the word Lord. And so basically it is this, Lord is one who possesses the power and authority to make decisions. In the pure sense, that's what Lord is. And so basically what we, what we find happening here is that it is that Jesus says, I am Lord. Jesus is Lord. And there's a couple of important realities about this. That when we look at this, Jesus said, go and do this. The apostles had no hesitancy taking direct orders from Jesus. So they had pretty much settled among themselves that this is who Jesus is. And then when they went to, the, to untie the colt, and the guy says, what are you doing? They said, the Lord needs it. They had no hesitancy in obeying the word of the Lord here. So when we say Jesus is Lord, and I think when they would say that at this point in time in Jesus' ministry, they probably didn't get the expanse of that statement. They, they, they may have understood it from the standpoint of Jesus has the authority to make this decision right here. They would have thought of a limited sphere. But when we say Lord today, and when we talk about Lordship, one of the things that we understand is that Jesus has power and authority, not just in limited spheres, but every sphere. There is not a place where Jesus does not have direct authority and power uh, to, to dictate whatever needs to be dictated. So Jesus makes a bold claim. Jesus is Lord. And he doesn't put a clarifier, Lord of. I think we have to understand that this is a blanket statement that Jesus is making here. He is the absolute ruler and authority over all of creation. But that's not it. That's not the only thing that we find here. Notice verses 7 and 8. And they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it. And he sat on it. And they spread their cloaks on the road and spread other uh, and others uh, spread leafy branches that they had cut from the fields. Interestingly, uh, that they knew the Old Testament better than we know the Old Testament. Uh, they they would have known the the, the stories of. Uh, of not just the Exodus, they would have known all of the stories, and they would have been able to equate what was happening here, because in 2 Kings 9, there was one of the, uh, the, what the kings of Israel was coming into the community. They did the exact thing. They, they laid branches on the ground as the king made his processional through the community. And so no one would be at a loss as to what is, is going on here. This is an ancient way of laying out the red carpet. Now, in our culture, we, we lay out red carpet for, for celebrities and different things like it. This would have been only relegated for specific dignitaries such as kings and princes. And so when Jesus is coming into town, they are making this incredible statement about who Jesus is. And Jesus is comfortable with this. But one of the things that we find is that this was foretold in Scripture. Uh, what it says in Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, says this, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he. I, I love this statement right here. Having salvation is he. Because this is going to preach here in, in just a few moments. Humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So as Jesus is coming in, then listen, they would have, again, they would have known the Old Testament more than what we know the Old Testament. As this is happening, one of the things that they would have been able to say is, Jesus is the long-awaited fulfillment of prophecy. Jesus is coming in this way. They would have been able to go, ah, oh, this is what we've been hoping for and longing for because most, most kings will come in on, on horses and chariots. This king 
comes riding on a donkey colt. And that would have been a light bulb moment for them to say prophecy is being fulfilled in our very presence today. But also in the actions of Jesus, he is clearly making another statement about his identity that the people would have had no problem declaring this. And Jesus is very clear by doing what he did. And so I'm going to build on the first statement. Jesus is Lord. He holds the position of king. So think about that here for a moment. And I I think it's important that we realize that even though he was king and they claimed him as king, they had no earthly idea what kind of king. Their lens that that they were looking at this this whole idea of kingship was through the lens of the physical. I mean, last week, as as we talked about uh, James and John and, and some of the things that were happening and them asking Jesus, if they could sit at his left and right, they were envisioning a physical, literal, military kingdom that was going to overthrow Rome. When the disciples were afraid, when Jesus was walking on ahead of them, they were thinking that there was going to be a, an ensuing war with Rome. When, 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 when James and John asked the question, can we set it your right and your left, they were asking, can we be your four-star generals in this upcoming battle. So invariably, the people of Israel, the people in Jerusalem, they, they were claiming Jesus as king, but they were thinking of that literal physical kingdom that Jesus was going to set up in a matter of days, if not hours. And he would kick Rome out. Now, before we read on, I think it's important that we understand what day this is. This is Sunday. And being that this is Sunday, this is the beginning of Passover. And being that this is the beginning of Passover, we would understand that the mindset of the Jewish people would be on the story of God. In fact, there, there was really kind of this, this, this kind of multifaceted aspect of what they would be thinking of. In fact, it was, uh, they, they would be thinking, number one, about what God had done in the past. They are retelling the story of the Exodus. They are retelling the story of liberation from Egypt and coming into the promised land. But it's not just that. They would also be looking forward to the future liberation and the coming of the messianic kingdom. So both the past and the present liberation would be on their minds. And also during this time, there were specific psalms from the book of Psalms that they would actually read or actually they would probably sing. And one of them is Psalm 118. And in verse 25, it says, Save us, we pray, O Lord, O Lord, we pray, Give us success. Now, when it says save us here, this is, this is a, an important thing. In the Jewish language, in the, in the Hebrew language, the word save us would have been pronounced Hosanna. Now, we think of that as a term of praise, but is actually a prayer of save us and save us now. And in verse 26, it says, Blessed is he who comes in the name of, our, of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. So notice now as we look in to verses 9 and 10. It says, And those who went before and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, save us, save us now. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna, save us in the highest. They were looking forward to the one who would save them. They were looking forward to the one who would save them now. They were saying, ultimately, that in Jesus lies the salvation that they are looking for and clinging to. And they are essentially saying that salvation is found in no one else other than Jesus. 
But the salvation they were looking for was not the salvation that they would find in Jesus. They were looking for an earthly kingdom. They were thinking about an earthly king who would come and fulfill all of their national dreams and hopes. They were thinking that when our guy gets on the throne, he's going to kick Rome out and we can have the kingdom that we want. This was strictly, in their minds, a physical kingdom. So, difficult conversation. We're not too different than the people 2,100 years ago. Because, if we're honest, if I'm honest, every four years I'm hoping for a political savior. Every four years we lose our ever-loving minds, which right now is a really short trip as a nation. <laughs> right? Right? But we lose our ever-loving minds because we are clinging to the hope of what a different physical governmental kingdom might bring us in our lives. And so we hang our hats on that. But remember this. Jesus was not the salvation that they wanted. He brought the salvation that they needed. And that is still true today. In fact, I want to go back to the book of Zechariah. Uh, the book of Zechariah, we, we find in, in chapter 9, verse 9, was kind of the fulfillment of prophecy that we can kind of look back and say, Look at this right here. But when you dig a little bit after this, we begin to see what kind of king and what kind of savior. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem, and, and the battle bows shall not be cut off or shall be cut off, and he shall speak peace to the nations. His rule shall be from sea to shining sea. And from the river to the ends of the earth. This is apocalyptic. This is very much future here. As for you also, oh, excuse me, yes, as for you also, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will set your prisoners free from the waterless pit. There's a freedom, but it's not freedom that we sometimes think. It's the freedom from sin. It's freedom from the hold that sin has in our lives. Go on down to verse 14. Then the Lord will appear over them, and his arrow will go forth like lightning. Uh, the Lord God will, will sound the trumpet and will march forth in the whirlwinds of the south, skipping on down to verse 16. On that day, the Lord their God will save them as the flock of his people, for, the, uh, for, uh, for like the jewels of a crown, they shall shine on his land. On that day, the Lord their God will save them. So, there's something important that plays out here. And I'm going to build on those previous statements Jesus is Lord. He holds the position of king. His work is salvation. This, this is where it, it really gets it for me. I, I'm going to be honest with you. Of all of the Easter stories, all parts of, of, of the, the passion narrative of Jesus, as it is often called, that starts right here, for 20-some years, this has been my least favorite sermon of all of them to preach. 
In fact, we do a series where we're going to put this in here. I could almost guarantee you one of the associate pastors is going to preach this passage. Because it's always just kind of been meh to me. It's, it's always been one of those passages where it's like, okay, Jesus fulfills prophecy. He is the king. I know all of that. But there's something that clicked this time. And this is why I say stick with Scripture. Because eventually it will click. Here's what clicked for me. And this is, this is the bottom line. Jesus uses his power as Lord and his position as king to save people. To save people who can't save themselves. And this is why Jesus is different. You want to know why Jesus is different? Jesus is different because the kings and the kingdoms of this world do all they can to promote their kingdom. To put the, to put the focus on, on self, to, to let others know how great they are. They, they use their power and their position to do all that they can to feed the ego, to fill the, 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 the pride tank. But what Jesus does as Lord and as King is he empties himself and becomes obedient to death, even death on the cross, to save us because we can't save ourselves. So there's a lot of sermons to be preached. And, and with all the sermons to be preached that there are, I'm going to say that there are really two kinds of sermons. This is what you need to know, and this is what you need to do. Uh, just really, a, a lot of sermons are, this is, this is information, this is theology, I want to give this to you. There are other sermons of, let's go out and win the world. And, and so really, this sermon kind of fits into the, 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 the narrative or, or into the category of this is what you need to know. Jesus is Lord, Jesus is King, his work is salvation. But with this, I think there's still, there's something we need to do. And when I think about this, this, this is where I'm going to land here today. Since Jesus is Lord, he gets to be Lord. Lord is one who has the power and authority to make decisions. This is where it gets really tough for me. You want to know why? Because I want to make my own decisions. I want to set my own direction. Guys, what are we known for? Not asking for directions. Not asking for help. I, the other day I had a neighbor offer help and I turned it down even though I probably needed it. You know why? Pride. And to let Jesus be Lord and to set the direction of our lives to make decisions for us, it's a difficult place for most of us to be. But there's also, also this, and this might be kind of synonymous. A throne is not a seat built for two. A throne is not a love seat. There is one king. He is on his throne. And the reality is this. The throne is occupied for the foreseeable future, and when I say foreseeable, I mean forever. There is never an opportunity for any of us to fill, to fill a vacancy on the throne that Jesus sits on. And so he's king. And if he's king, I have to honor the king. 
I have to live for the king. I have to realize that my role is not to put the focus and attention on myself. My role is to, to put focus and attention on the king. My role is to be about the business of the king. Not about me. It's not about what I want. It's not about my desires. I, in, in many ways, when you are a subject of the king, you're an ambassador. An ambassador carries the, the, the message from the king and, and, and really represents the king in every way. And so, if he's king, we are not. If he's king, we have to be about his business. And so what is his business? To me, it's very simple. His business is salvation. His business is saving people who can't save themselves, which means every human who has ever walked this planet whose name is not Jesus. And so with that, I have to know this. And there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Salvation belongs to Jesus and Jesus alone. And I'm going to say this. If you're not a follower of Jesus here today, you can't save yourself. You will never be good enough. You will never pray enough. You will never serve enough. Salvation lies only with Jesus. And as a follower today, we are tasked with the responsibility of this right here. We need to let people know about our Lord and King and the work that he can do in their life. Will you join me in prayer? Father God in heaven, I thank you for saving us through your son Jesus. So Father, right now I pray that that if we do not know you as Savior, we don't leave here without that. And Father, I pray that we take this message with us. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.